Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently, who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And we may start a new feature on the show of Great Women in Science, and if we do, tonight's feature subject will certainly be one of the highlights. We're going to talk about Stephanie Polak, who died recently at the age of 90. Stephanie was a nice Polish girl born outside Pittsburgh, and she became a brilliant chemist. She went to work for DuPont. And in those days, DuPont was quite successful and quite innovative, having developed the first synthetic fiber nylon. While at DuPont, Stephanie serendipitously discovered Kevlar, which turned out to be a bulletproof material and has revolutionized American life and saved many lives. For this, Stephanie became one of the first women to be inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Here's an NBC report on Stephanie Kolick. Stephanie Kolick has died. She invented the incredibly strong fibers that became known as Kevlar, the basis for our modern body armor, and then some. She was a chemist for DuPont, a groundbreaking scientist and a mentor to countless women in her field. She advanced at DuPont in part because so many men were off in the military just after World War II. Her invention was a liquid that she spun into thread. Countless veterans and police officers in this country are alive today because of the work she did. Here is a Chemical Heritage Foundation report on the story of Stephanie Kolek and the discovery of Kevlar. I loved learning, and I loved learning new things and making discoveries. Stephanie Kowalik was born in 1923 near Pittsburgh. When I was a child, I was a very creative child. I watched my mother sewing and uh, making patterns. I imitated, actually, what she did. I used her sewing machine when she wasn't around. It was fun. And it was creative, and it gave me a great deal of satisfaction. I had a father who was very much interested in plants and trees. He and I spent a lot of time roaming through the woods, looking for animals and snakes and leaves and wild plants. And I put all these things in a scrapbook. I remember seeing my father when he would come home from work, sit and read the newspaper and books and so forth. I spent four years in grades one to four, and it was a small school in the country. If you spoke out of turn, as I did once upon a time, you could make a lot of boys very angry, especially if you knew the answer to a math problem. <laughs> you know, I did much more reading than was intended for someone in my years. In addition, I had an excellent memory. I was different from a lot of the students there. This probably made me what I am today. In 1942, Stephanie enrolled in the Carnegie Institute of Technology, now Carnegie Mellon University, as a chemistry major. I think while I was in college that I was greatly influenced by a woman professor who taught me chemistry. Uh, Dr. Clara Miller. You know, it was not an easy time for women. I considered myself very green, but they were asking a number of people there to give a talk, and it really surprised me that they asked me to give a talk on my work. So I thought to myself, you know, I must be pretty good. I thought that I might be a designer, a dress designer. And then I thought I might be an MD doctor, but it didn't have the money. In 1946, she graduated a Margaret Morrison chemistry major with a bachelor's degree. And I thought, well, I'll go out and work, save my money, and then I'll go to medical school. When I entered the workforce in 1946, not many women were being hired, but the few that were, were hired because there were so few men available. They were at war or just coming back from war. Women were being made offers, and many women did not stay very long. When I graduated from college, I had a choice. I could work for Gulf Research or I could work for DuPont. I thought if I was going to work, I wanted to do research. And I thought DuPont had greater potential, even though I didn't expect to spend the rest of my life there. At DuPont, Stephanie joined a team of chemists called the Pioneering Research Laboratory, just a few years after DuPont's monumental creation of the world's first synthetic fiber, nylon. I started out doing research and still intended to go to medical school, but eventually the work became so interesting and I had the opportunity to make discoveries. I discovered 
that chemistry was the field I wanted to be in when I actually started working for DuPont. I was very fortunate that I worked under men who were very much interested in making discoveries and inventions. And I was able to experiment on my own. And I found this very stimulating. It appealed to the creative person in me. In 1965, there was talk of a gasoline shortage. So DuPont issued its researchers a challenge. Look for the next generation high performance fiber to take the place of steel wire and tires because lighter tires were ensure better fuel economy. I was assigned to look for this super strong, super stiff, but lightweight fiber. In the course of that work, I made a discovery. I was working with these very long chain, extent, or they're called extended chain polymers, where you had a lot of benzene rings in them that were difficult to dissolve and I found a solvent uh, to dissolve them in. The solution was very peculiar. It was not the typical polymer solution, which is sort of like syrup. Instead, this was a very thin solution. It was very watery. Not only was it watery, but it was opalescent. Transforming a polymer solution from a liquid to a fiber requires a process called spinning. A spinneret forces the liquid through tiny holes to create strands, then spins them, similar to the way cotton candy is made, to build the fibrous material. The fellow who does the spinning looked at it and said, this solution is too thin, it's too watery. Furthermore, it has particles in it and it's gonna plug up my equipment. Actually, he was interpreting the opalescence as particles. I filtered this solution. I knew there were no particles in it, and he still refused to spin it. Eventually, after a few days, he had a gilly conscience or something, and he came and said he would spin that thing. We spun it, and it spun beautifully. It was very strong and very stiff, unlike anything we had made before. I knew that I had made a discovery. I didn't shout Eureka, <laughs> but I was very excited, as was the whole laboratory excited and management was excited because we were looking for something new, something different, and this was it. DuPont Kevlar fiber makes hundreds of household and industrial items safe and cut resistant. It's lightweight and extraordinarily strong, five times as strong as steel. Best known for its use in ballistic and stab-resistant body armor, Kevlar has heroically helped to save the lives of thousands of people around the world. From vehicles and industrial clothing to fiber optics and city roads, Stephanie's persistence in the lab back in 1965 has led us to a new world. I really did not think of the bulletproof vest. We had Dr. Joe Rivers, who at that time was already looking for fibers and making bulletproof vests. And I remember the very first time that I spun uh, the 14B that he came over and he said, if you can possibly spare a tiny bit of that fiber, I would like to test it and see if it'll be useful in a bulletproof vest. It's the vest, you know, it's made up of many layers. So it isn't just a single layer of cloth. Four pound helmets lined with Kevlar are up to 40% more resistant to shrapnel than old steel helmet. Today's ground troops, as well as most journalists, must wear helmets and vests lined with Kevlar for vital body protection. The weave of the fabric has a bit of give and absorbs the blow of a high velocity object, distributing its force across the other fibers instead of being pierced by it. A lot of what happens in Iraq or any other war is fragments. I mean, there's explosions and both fragments from the explosive itself and anything that's blown up in an explosion gets thrown around. Kevlar is great at stopping these flying chunks of metal. And a Kevlar vest and helmet cover most of your upper body and your head, but it protects your vital organs from damage. When a bullet hits this vest, it's slowed down and finally stopped as it meets the fabric made of Kevlar. A low velocity bullet like a pistol or for pieces of metal flying through the air, it'll bend but not break. And that means that the fragment doesn't get through. You get bruised, but you don't have a piece of metal going through you, which is a huge difference. 
When I look back on my career, I'm inspired most by the fact that I was fortunate enough to do something that would be of benefit to mankind. It's been an extremely satisfying discovery. I don't think there's anything like saving someone's life to bring you satisfaction and happiness. Stephanie Quilla. We're going to move on now to Gerard Jerry Conlon, who died recently at the age of 60, and he was one of the Guilford Four. In 1974, he was wrongly convicted of an IRA bombing of the Horse and Groom Pub in Guilford, England. He spent nearly 15 years in jail before he was exonerated, and it was turned into a superb movie called In the Name of the Father, starring Daniel Day-Lewis as Jerry Conlon. I have to tell you, this is a case that's pretty much comparable to the Hurricane Carter case, which we talked about, although this was a much worse travesty of justice and a better movie also. It was a real indictment of the British justice system. Here's a BBC report on Jerry Conlon. Striding to freedom after years in jail, Jerry Conlon was a victim of one of the most serious miscarriages of justice in British history. I've been in prison 15 years for something I didn't do, for something I didn't he and three others had been jailed for life for carrying out the Guildford pub bombings in 1974, which left five dead and dozens injured. The prisoners became known as the Guildford Four and always insisted they'd been framed. They were released in 1989. Sixteen years later, they received a formal apology from the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair. I'm very sorry that they were subject to such an ordeal and such an injustice. In the 1990s, the story was made into an Oscar-nominated film in the name of the father. Mr Conlon used his high profile to campaign on behalf of other victims of injustice. A politician and friend paid tribute to his work. He didn't cry about his own situation. He basically set out to make sure that others didn't suffer the same horrible fate that he had suffered. But his own years in prison haunted Mr Conlon. After that length of time, you don't come out of prison and just blend in with society. It does take a lot of getting used to. I really haven't got used to it. I still wake up sweating. After his death in Belfast this morning, Jerry Conlon's relatives issued a statement saying he brought life, love, intelligence, wit and strength to our family through its darkest hours. They went on, we recognise that what he achieved by fighting for justice for us had a far, far greater importance. It forced the world's closed eyes to be opened to injustice. Mr. Conlon's family said they believed he had changed the course of history. Well, as I said, the movie is quite good. It's got Pete Pastaway in it. We did his podcast and mentioned it. And it also has Emma Taps. And here's a trailer from the movie. It was a time of innocence. No property, no law, just love. What should we call you? They call me Wales One. In the wake of the Guildford pub bombing deaths, the government has responded with emergency legislation and increased police powers of search and arrest. I have the right to speak to my son. You are in trouble, Conlon. What are you charging me with? The murders of five people. Get out of your mind! I told you how to make the bomb, Jerry. I didn't do this. What are you trying to do to me? Stop, what are you doing in there? Conspiracy to murder. Their arrest was only the beginning. My name's Giuseppe Conlon. I'm an innocent man. So is my son. Of a remarkable journey. All of the defendants claim that they were subjected to physical and mental abuse while under police custody. We're never harmed in any way. How do you find the defendants? Guilty as charged. No! From the hands of a government. This is your home for the rest of your life. Who knew they were innocent? What are we going to do now? To the heart of a lawyer. This conspiracy of silence has kept my client behind bars for 14 years. Determined to prove it. There's guilty as sin. <laughs> of justice, in the name of truth, in the name of love, in the name of the Father. Sounds like our old friend Hal Douglas there. Well, I want to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tapps. I'm going to close tonight with Johnny Mann, who died at the age of 85. He was the band leader who was the head of the Johnny Mann Singers, and he was also the musical director for the Joy Bishop Show. didn't like his music that much, but he did one thing I liked. He was the voice of Theodore for the Chipmunks. So in his memory, we'll close with the number one song on Christmas of 1958. Okay, Theodore. Uh, very good, Theodore. <laughs> Bye, 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 Bye. Bye.